Well, hi, Sierra. Thank you so much for joining me for this interview series. I'm with Sierra Stinson, a local artist and curator in Seattle who just got through, I think, one of the most intense, hectic work <laughs> experiences of your life, maybe. It's the largest thing I've worked on, yes. <laughs> well, thank you for project. coming here. It sounds like it just barely ended. What was it? Yeah, it was an independent survey of contemporary art um, in conjunction and response to the Seattle Art Fair. So it was a separate entity. Like a satellite fair. Yes. Wow, exactly. so Seattle finally got its first art fair and satellite fair. So yeah. Yeah, awesome. we wanted to hit it right there at the beginning. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah. So what all went into it? Um, how many artists did you work with and what role did you play? Um, I was a co-curator um, with uh, Vital Five Productions, which is run by Greg Lundgren. Um, he invited three of us to co-curate with him. So Kirsten Anderson, Sharon Arnold, and myself um, all worked together to bring a pool of we started with a list that was probably around two to three hundred artists and we narrowed it down to 110. Wow. Was that brutal? Was it hard? Or did you find it to be nice to kind of purge and really focus? It was really great to work on, to actually have that as an issue. Yeah. <laughs> Seattle is completely covered in so many different artists and it's the list is never ending and I'm constantly meeting new people and so it was really exciting to just start with what we knew. People that I was familiar with or had desired to work with after a long while of working in Seattle arts community. So I handled around 35 artists um, on my list and a little over half of them I had worked with before and then the rest were new. Wow. So, mm -hmm. so how is it, um, how was the comparison between working with an artist that you already kind of knew, they're mm -hmm. a bit of a known quantity, mm -hmm. and the new ones? Um, you know, everybody for this project, because we were all realizing how big of a deal it was for Seattle, like to actually do a survey of this scale hasn't been done as long as I've lived here, and I've been here for 11 years. Um, in this way and so everybody really stepped up their game and were like you know they felt it, you could tell the artists felt the stakes were higher because of the Seattle Art Fair being there because there is an outside view of the city there were people coming in from around the country and so it was everyone wanted to kind of like bring their best to the table, including a lot of really large scale works. <laughs> <laughs> My best is enormous. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bigger does not mean better. Right. But <laughs> curatorial lesson number one from Sierra <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was really exciting. The newer artists I worked with were so amazing and I learned a lot from working with them and checking out their studios and seeing what they were currently up to and the work that was selected was a range of work some of the work was from 2006 some of it was made on the spot in the space oh wow um, yeah there are some large-scale installations made um, specifically using the area like um, Tib and Rice did a piece that was um, based on the clock tower, the King Street clock tower, um, which is in, connected to the building. And um, he, yeah, it sort of digitally mapped it, 3D mapping of it wow. um, through photographs and then turned that into a video installation. Cool. Yeah. Wow, mm -hmm. so do you have any um, any pieces? I mean, you just described mm -hmm. that yeah. one. That one was really stuck out. Do you have any other pieces yeah. that really um, seem to perform really well or they really struck you for a certain reason or they captured the feel of what you what you wanted out of sight to to really feel like definitely um on our list so we had a list of artists to invite and um, we would then review what they wanted to do um or what we wanted from them and um one of the artists that i've been watching for years um is marian peters and she recently did an exhibition at James Harris Gallery where she's represented. And it was this really gorgeous um, piece that was with dried flowers. And um, in front of it was a like bees, beehive, like kind of sheet 
Huh. And so you couldn't see it, the vantage points where it vignetted everything. So you had to like mm -hmm. interact with it in order to um, see the whole picture, but you couldn't see the whole picture. It was a really moving piece and I, she stuck out in my mind of like installation. And when I spoke to her, um, she wanted to make a brand new work in collaboration with her assistant, Mackenzie, who is someone I've known for 11 years now since the first day I met, like it's the first day I went to school in Seattle. And um, they created this, um, it was made out of flour, like the powder, <laughs> not dried flowers. And um, it was just compacted and um, imprinted, like stenciled onto um, this large sort of Persian rug. Wow. Um, piece and it uh, was, was very the, delicate. What were the dimensions <laughs> of something so delicate? I have to check the dimensions of those. It was, I mean, I think it was like, oh gosh, good question. I don't know. Um, it looked like it was about 20 feet by 16 feet. It looked quite large. It was really large. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, it was a really large scale rug, like an area rug that you would have in a, a big room like a giant living room um wow. and yeah so and everyone was convinced that it was plaster that they used water that they you know it had to be solid in some form yeah. and it wasn't it was completely loose and wow. just constructed in a way where it was compacted onto the floor that is so great yeah wow that piece really moved me and it was also the most delicate piece in the show <laughs> like we were constantly had people keeping anyone from stepping onto it because it's white you said and that to on me. gray i was like oh, oh <laughs> i am really close to that that's not okay yeah <laughs> yeah tiny little barrier of white string <laughs> yeah. wow yeah so that piece definitely it was called impossible monument and it really struck me and I loved it living in the space by these windows and it just I didn't want to see it go today we deinstalled it and I oh. was so sad I cried <laughs> <laughs> so Sierra has a sensitive side <laughs> yeah a very empathetic curator yeah. over here <laughs> um, do you mm -hmm. consider yourself an artist and curator or do you consider yourself more primarily a curator that is a good question I um, I went to art school because I wanted to be around artists. I didn't go to become an artist. Oh, interesting. So I, um, I think that art is a part of my life completely, and I do make work every now and then, but I don't have an ongoing practice. Curating turned into that for yeah. me. Yeah, straight out of school, like, I just started curating and working with artists and enabling spaces and that's really where my focus went that's great but yeah but I'm always inspired by all of the shows and always want to make sort of response pieces or I like writing a lot so what do you write um uh, mostly just rambles and tangents about things it goes in and out of personal and poetry and do you write any um art criticism or essays Is, does art come into your writing at all like that it does, but it's usually experiential. I don't really like to have the critical eye around it. I don't really feel like going into great depth about that. I think that I enjoy that writing, and that's why Vignettes is sort of focused on writing about art. I, I would like it to be a little more constructive, generally. So you just said Vignettes. What oh. is Vignettes? <laughs> Another project. <laughs> vignettes is my ongoing, very malleable project. Um, it started off as an exhibition space in my home, um, in my studio apartment on Capitol Hill in Seattle. In what year was that? 2010. And uh, it was a one night only exhibition space and it continued on for um, four years. And then I decided to close the doors um, last year. And what made you decide to close the doors? <laughs> Well, I wanted to kind of open up space and in my capacity to work on other things and to expand vignettes in a different way, like maybe focus more on import-export elements and not 
feel too insular to the community of Seattle because we're very supportive and wonderful here, but you want to continue to make sure things are reaching outside of our bubble. <laughs> so yeah, so that was what I decided to do. And, and I think I'll still have shows every now and then. <laughs> you miss it? Just don't want to regularly. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I do. I miss having that um, energy in my space. Yeah. Like the, it cleanses an area to have bodies move through it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you started out having shows, and then you quit doing the shows, and now mm-hmm. it's been malleable. What has it morphed into? Um, it launched into an online site that um, enables more art writing, independent art writing, um, studio visits with artists, and the idea is to focus more on underrepresented artists, um, artists who maybe they lost their gallery because it closed. That's a very common thing in Seattle um, in the last decade. And or they're an up-and-coming artist that doesn't really get a lot of attention. Um, Yeah. Yeah, so we just, we have like a roster of artists that we work with and support and um, do studio visits with and feature and and then we just want to constantly have it open to other yeah, people um, writing about art. Have you seen the blog, I Need a Guide? Mm-hmm. Is it sort yeah. of after that a little bit? I mean, granted, the taste of that is quite different, but... Yeah, I discovered that one a little later um, while we were starting to form. Um, it was more responding to In the Make hmm. is one that's about studio visits specifically. Oh, cool. mm-hmm. And they kind of travel around the coast and stuff, and they go, and they do video pieces. We haven't done any video ones, but I did definitely reference that. Peter Scherer is a painter here, and he was featured on it, and that was when I saw it. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, so I think it's a little more like that. Yeah. Um, Video's getting big. Yeah. You know, getting, Video's it's just if, As long as you can keep up with all the editing and get it out and produce it, yeah, you've got a great medium, but man, it's a lot to keep up with. <laughs> it is. It's really hard. I know. I That was... Probably why I stopped making a lot of art because my focus was video installation. Oh so. wow! Yeah, <laughs> a little complicated. It takes time. <laughs> it takes a lot of time and focus. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you have any other projects that you're working on now or that you're moving into? Um, yeah, there's one that happens next weekend. Nepo 5K Don't Run. Um, it started off as the idea of an art run, but the city said you can't run, so. They Who wants it. to run by art anyway, right? <laughs> yeah. So we turned it into a don't run. <laughs> and um, this is the fifth and final year for it. It's oh. a literal art walk that come, goes from Hinghe and the ID up to Beacon Hill to Nepo House, which is Clara Glosova's home. And why is this the last year of it? Um, it's, it's also a shift for that sort of import export element I think um, Clara it wants to work on creating a residency in the Czech Republic mm-hmm. and she just recently received a grant to work on it and yeah so she just came back from her research trip and wow. yeah we'll see we'll see what happens but we want to do it would be cool to have this project kind of expand and go elsewhere yeah mm-hmm. and maybe have some more cross-pollination from somewhere exactly yeah. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, I've actually been wondering if I should just put together everything I know about putting, making a residency and make that like a package and be like, you want to start a residency, here's the big book. Yeah. <laughs> All the mistakes I made. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, yeah. it's so helpful. Yeah. I it's really nice. helpful. I've had a few people reach out and say, how, how did you? And I'm like, I don't have time to look up from doing it to tell you about it, but if you want to pop over and have lunch, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. It's yeah. tough to fit it all in when you're trying to have a practice. And It's very true. Yeah. I know, um, like a year ago, this person contacted me about, how do you do projects like vignettes? How does this, how do you do this? Like, how do you open your home? And I was like, you just do it first and then you find out (laughs) yeah (laughs) you just do it first and then you find out exactly yeah and it's exciting I mean you got to troubleshoot a little bit and certain things but yeah you feel it out and yeah you pick yourself up you do it again it's not a failure if you do it I think that's true yeah um oh I was just gonna ask you another question and I lost it (laughs) go it's not a failure if you do it I kind of like that (laughs) It's true, yeah. I had a very funny stoner moment of being like, like it 
it sounds like a stoner moment. I wasn't stoned, <laughs> but I was like, we're totally doing what we're doing because we're doing it. It's great. We're doing the right thing. Like, <laughs> you know, and you're like, what are you on acid? Like, totally. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, it's just the way it is. Like, we're where we need to be. <laughs> like, you're from California. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> How can you tell? <laughs> did anybody sort of inspire you to take this path, or did you see anyone before you that you were like, oh, I think I'm going to kind of do it that way, or maybe I'll take a piece from this and that and, you know, piece it together? Um, I think at least why I started Vignettes was because I had lived in Glasgow and we used a lot, I went to school there at Glasgow School of Art and worked on public art projects and worked in spaces that were very alternative and I just learned that, oh, you can do this, you can ask this of a city, you can make space out of anything and it's possible. And so I came back to Seattle with this mentality of like, we've got space, we've got, we've got things to use, we can do that. And then I looked around, I had been living with a friend and they moved out and I looked around and was like, oh, I only have three pieces of furniture in this place. This could be a gallery. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Sparse living led to a whole new career. <laughs> yeah. Minimalist curating. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That is awesome. So it was just, it clicked. Wow. Yeah. Um, do you have any books that you that you really recommend, whether they're on this topic or they just have been personal inspirations that you know really have moved you and they kind of continue to move you? The Wonderful World of Henry Sugar by Roald Dahl. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good story. <laughs> it's really short and sweet. There's, oh. It's a book of short stories, but the one about Henry Sugar is really good because it's supposed to be true. But how could it be? <laughs> um, that's one from childhood. Um, and then, well, anything about like Hans Ulrich Obreist, like I really love reading his kind of, he's a curator and does, um, why am I drawing a blank always on <laughs> what, exactly what space is <laughs> he runs? Um, but yeah, they're like is he a constant inspiration. He's UK, yeah. United Kingdom. Well, I mean, he's from Germany. I, I don't know where he's from. But um, he runs, he does a lot of stuff in contemporary United Kingdom, oh, like cool. England, so forth. In London, he has, like, there's a space. And um, yeah, I've just always been inspired by his thoughts on curating. There's a lot of great books and essays. And Do you have the titles of any of the books? Um, I think there's one that's called A History of Contemporary Curating. Okay. There's, check it out. Yeah. I'm very bad at titles and names. Oh, For I being know. a curator, I you know, should I, be better. I, know. <laughs> I, I like the triangle one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you yeah. should never have kids. You won't remember them. <laughs> the reason we did Out of Sight was really to learn all the names of the artists in Seattle. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, well, there's also, I guess, just um, a couple more questions sort of about your definition of, of a life well-lived and of success. Mm -hmm. So do you have any thoughts on, like, just how you personally view, either when you see it on someone else, like, oh, that is, that person, I, I consider them successful. Or for yourself, when you're like, oh, this is it, I've made it, I'm, this, this means I'm, I've been successful in this, I feel like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard, success is a really hard word, it's not one I like actually use. Why don't you like it? I, oh, you use it? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I just haven't, I don't think of, I think this was the first project where I like walked away from it and was like, it was an accomplishment. Like, <laughs> that was the word I used. And I was like, it's a great success. And I was like, it, we accomplished what we set out to do. <laughs> but um, yeah, success is a hard one. I, um, I think like breathing is a success, you know? I think that it's really like, like this world is a really difficult world to live in. And if you are enjoying what you're doing and active in it, then that is a complete success. Like, you know, your existence is a success. If you're not causing anything like, you know, 
damaging or hurting people like intentionally if you're playing nice in the sandbox and enjoying the sandbox <laughs> yeah exactly that's a success <laughs> that is a perfect success you know <laughs> you're being present you're aware of your surroundings that's successful that's successful so, all right yeah <laughs> i like that um and one last question i think this is the end of it and it's um are you more of like a night owl or an early person? And when do you find your peak hours to be? Is like, or do you have really intensely creative hours and they're consistent that way? There's just so many stereotypes around artists and creatives and people in the arts. Like you've got to be up late drinking wine and peeing <laughs> yeah. off a balcony. Oh yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, you got to be up to peeing off a balcony. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I am an early bird. I um, by nature or by force. I like work or whatever. Believe by nature. <laughs> um, I think I've always, yeah, I've always enjoyed mornings. I always liked kind of taking off and doing stuff early in the morning. Um, I that is when I get a lot of ideas, and that is when I'm actually at my prime communicating moment. Like, I can write a lot of emails first thing in the morning to everyone. So many people say that. I agree completely. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's wonderful. Um, I feel clear-headed. I, like, start off, and I'm solid. And then later, by the end of the day, I'm like, I don't know. I don't Just have words. Don't like, talk to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not that good at this anymore. I've communicated too much today. Um, but, yeah, I think that, yeah, it's... Definitely a morning person. You're a morning person? Yeah. And but are you creative in the morning? Not necessarily. I think I get all my ideas when I'm in a car usually. Okay. <laughs> for me, it's the shower. I understand. Yeah. This stuff happens. Yeah. Car is a really good vessel for a lot of things, especially crying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's really good for ideas. It's really good for creating videos in your head because there's constant movement around you, right? Hopefully, <laughs> unless you're stuck in traffic in LA or something. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I get a lot of ideas while traveling. I think I have to set aside time to travel in order to create. And um, that's where, yeah, being in that limbo state is really good for me. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, being a little uprooted. Yeah. Exactly. A little bit of displacement. Mm -hmm. It's healthy for everyone. Totally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, do you have any final thoughts? Or Oh, actually, I have to ask you this. Oh, yeah. um, how can I find out, how can anybody else find out where to learn more about you? Um, I, vignettes is the best way. So, um, vignettes.us is the website. And, um, and that's V-I-G-N-E-T-T-E-S. -T -T -E dot us all right yeah um and do you have any websites um to your recent projects that people should check out um yeah vital five productions.com is where you will find more information on out of sight and um you can always uh, we're pretty avid on instagram for vignettes gallery and constant yeah constant feeds going on there Okay. Um, and, and then nepohouse.org is where you can find anything on Nepo. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. I've got those, those all written down. Thank you so yeah. much. And yeah. um, do you have any final thoughts for the world that you want to just put out? Final thoughts final for thoughts. the world. Um, cars are good for crying. Cars are really good for crying. Um, <laughs> yeah, my memoir. <laughs> Get ready for that one. <laughs> crying in cars. Um, <laughs> thoughts for the world um I don't know I feel very positive about the world in spite of all of the shit that's been going down it's been really rough politically and I think that it's good to have the fatal optimists around <laughs> and so keep doing it you're doing all right <laughs> Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming and doing <laughs> oh, this. Oh, thank you. It's such a delight. I love seeing you. <laughs> I love seeing you, too. Oh, it's a love fest. <laughs> love party. <laughs>